Conversations around artificial intelligence has been dominating the airwaves ever since the last quarter of last year with the launch of ChatGPT. Businesses and individuals alike ever since have been trying to grapple with this new phenomenon, this new technology that has come to shape the way we live and do business. I've got some fantastic experts in the room uh, with whom I'm going to be having a conversation about all things artificial intelligence. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, you're welcome you. to the show today. So today I've got uh, Chris Meir, who is the founder and CEO of School of Code. I've got uh, Sabin Nair, who's in the room as well. And Sabin is the founder of Origin 21. And uh, I've got Bjorn Hetanjohan, who is uh, uh, the Transformation Director at Visual Limited, uh, which is a part of the Nord4 Group. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah. Okay, you. great. So let's get started with this conversation around artificial intelligence it's a very interesting topic but it all it's been around for a while we've been talking about it i mean we hear about it every now and then but it only really came to the fore at least for the general populace around the third and fourth quarter of last year with the launch of chat gpt i think the place that i like to get started with and i like every one of you to weigh in on this probably starting with you uh is what do you make of artificial intelligence generally i mean your subject matter experts in your own right but generally speaking both as a business person as an individual what do you make of it yeah small small question to get started with um what do i make of artificial intelligence generally like you say i mean it's in the public consciousness now um from the last year and you can see that as a hype and there are cycles of ai hype um known as ai summers and ai winters and what usually happens is there's a load of hype and it doesn't live up to the hype and then all the funding dries up and then there's a period of just winter. like, yeah, winter, right? Like desolation. It's, it, it's confined back to the um, that's a sort of academic drawing, drawing board sort of thing. But um, there's a big difference, I think, in, in this one, which is actually the techniques used for all of the hype recently have been around for 50 years. So it's not the techniques that have changed, although they've been optimised. Um, actually, it's the compute power and the, the amount of data. So that the types of artificial intelligence and the, the types of machine learning that, that are really taking off um, all need massive amounts of data and massive amounts of compute power to be realistic, right? So they could be the same techniques of five, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, but actually because now there's more data created than ever before, um, each year we've got more data created than has ever existed and you've now got in your iPhone you've got more compute power than put people on the moon you know we're just in a different world of actually even these rudimentary techniques can now have like massively massive impactful, compute power um, exactly and also and the outcomes. availability of data as well has really transformed uh, a lot of that and, and Sabin what is it that you make of artificial intelligence the fears the hysteria the opportunities what are your thoughts look um, it's interesting you, you say 50 years uh, it's actually in, in, I think it's 1931, a guy by the name of Alan Turing, a British guy. He's actually the one that postulated uh, artificial intelligence. And again, the thing that held everything back was the access to, um, you know, powerful computers. And it's actually the first AI algorithm was, was written in 1955 uh, by Christopher Stachy. Stachy, I think it's called. Um, and it was actually a checkers game. So it's been around for, for ages. Um, the thing that's accelerated it, yes, the power of computing. Um, and I think, you know, we, we work in process control automation and the biggest drive we've seen recently is massive data centers. Uh, data centers coming up all over the place and it gives you access to, to powerful cloud computing. And that's actually where, you know, where, where the true engine of AI lies. It's in, the, it's in the, the data. And I think that's the fundamental thing, having the data and then having the processing power in, in order to analyze the data Fantastic. and from that obviously you can uh, yeah you get the artificial intelligence Fantastic. And, and, and beyond would it be the same for you or uh, what, what other perspectives do you think uh, needs to be needs to be you know put to the fore when it comes to ai yeah so for me ai has been as, as my uh, colleagues already said has been around for for quite a long while and pr probably everybody has an iPhone or an Android phone and using Siri and Alexa and all the other products. And nobody really pays any attention anymore that all these things are driven by AI as a technology. So everybody is using the, the voice assistants that you have today. 
But for me, I almost want to call it another, uh, maybe the fifth uh, industrial revolution that we see right now through the use of uh, the GPT capabilities. And um, GPT is around for a while. So at the moment we're using 3.5 or, or even version four. Some people can already use version four. And with that uh, larger data set, uh, as Chris described, that's really why we now have these uh, massively increased capabilities. And again, they will and have already uh, had uh, seen uh, some introduction into commercial products. Microsoft uh, have released things like Copilot for all their Office and Dynamics products and maybe even into uh, Azure. But that's uh, that's really why we see the, the big uptake now, because suddenly it becomes accessible to the wider public. I, I think uh, it's a very interesting conversation uh, uh, and what you just brought up as well in terms of, you know, it being sort of like the dawn of Industrial Revolution 5.0 because, you know, uh, the, the way that I see artificial intelligence, unlike, you know, something like the metaverse or, or, or blockchain, which are just, you know, pieces of technologies that open up new possibilities, artificial intelligence cuts across, you know, it, it, it becomes sort of like one of those underlying technologies that society is built upon. However, there could be some challenges around that. I mean, we already have issues around privacy, around programming bias. We already have issues around misinformation and just outright falsehood, you know. And as people begin to grapple with this new thing and everybody say, no, you should try this AI tool and that, how should we factor these challenges into our thinking, whether or not we adopt it or how we utilize it? So how, how does those challenge how do those challenges factor into the thinking uh, uh, of uh, different consumers of AI products yeah well I, I would say it's um, there's one answer which is hopeful which is um, actually we can use a little bit of um, thinking before we act and analyze you know what are the pros and cons of this technology but the truth is as we know like technology is, is essentially Pandora's box and so, you, can, you know, it's really difficult to see a world where people are going to be making those decisions. Convenience is a vice. And, and this, this type of technology just makes convenience. It takes it to a whole new level. So it's you know. convenience on steroids. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you, could, you know, um, you, you're heading into a future of, you know, sort of just in time software sometimes where, you know, you, you at the moment, there has to be a company existing for years and years, building some software towards solving your problem but you're one of many people that have that problem. So it's a bit generic, might be a bit personalized. There's a future coming where actually you could say, I want the problem solved in this exact way. And within a couple of minutes, you have custom made software spat out and for you to use, right? So, so that is, that's gonna be very hard for people not to engage with and say, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the slow way actually. You know, so. And that's quite interesting. Beyond in your opinion, you know, uh, like Chris has said, there's this optimism there because it just makes for great optimism but shouldn't we be pumping the brakes what are your thoughts i think with any technology we need to introduce a, a right framework of, of rules and policies of how technology is adopted when cars came out uh, there was a highway code introduced and rules and who should drive on which side of the road with ai it's the same thing ai needs to be accessible but ai needs to have the right governance that what data is put into the data set in order to train AI. That's basically what, what it is. And we need to make sure that that data set is representative of all the information that we have available today so that it doesn't become biased or as with as little bias as possible. And I think then we take a responsible approach towards AI and that's the most important thing. Uh, and I think that that you know, segues perfectly into the open letter that was re released on the uh, Future of Life Institute's website on the 22nd of March. They have the signature of, uh, currently has a signature of over 20,000 AI experts. Uh, notable amongst the names are Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple. And literally, for those who wouldn't know what is in that open letter, it's literally a call from the leading experts of artificial intelligence across the world for all AI labs to halt, you know, the, the development and the training of new AI models, advanced AI models for the next six months. 
for the sole purpose of making sure that that six months is utilized to develop, you know, safety guidelines and safety protocols that would make sure that, you know, AI doesn't end civilization, essentially. But then there's also been, you know, uh, reports in the media with uh, talking about some other notable people saying, you know what, you know, not necessarily point some cold water uh, on that. You know, the, the Bill Gates has been mentioned to be in that camp and things of that nature. What do you make of this, you know, industry leaders being the one to lead this charge? And, and beyond, you just talked about it as well in terms of, you know, creating the highway code, you know, for, for this vehicle called artificial intelligence. You know, what, what do you make of all of this and who should be leading on that responsibility? And I want to start with you, uh, Asabin, on that one. Uh, I think we... We're walking a very thin ethical line when it comes to AI because the problem with AI it's it's a program that's been developed to analyze data without emotion. Now, can you imagine mm. having a doctor that has to decide whether or not to pull the plug based on the probability of whether he thinks you're going to survive or not? <laughs> I mean, you know, um, uh, and the question you asked is, you know, who who should be the leader of this? I mean, do you do you really think an Elon Musk could be the one that would? take that sort of e emotional uh, decision. You know, so we've got to be very, very uh, careful. And the problem actually is that the way the internet was developed, you know, it was developed without foresight. So your data is already out there. The problem now is going to be trying to find what data is out there and how do you secure that? And I think that's a bigger <laughs> problem. It's a problem <laughs> waiting to happen. I, I think that the way you put it is so fascinating, you know, uh, doctors without emotions and things of that nature. And, you know, one of the things that was in that open letter that came out was was the conversation around, you know, do we want unelected tech leaders being the one developing tools that are literally just shaping our civilization and our society? What are your thoughts on this one, Chris? Yeah, so uh, I actually I signed that letter, but not that anyone listens to me. <laughs> um, yeah, like I, my um, bachelor's, master's and PhD were all in AI, loved it. But um, I felt like actually society wasn't ready for um, the changes that AI would bring. I saw mass disruption of um, livelihoods, um, mass automation of things. And yes, sometimes there'll be new jobs created, but how are you going to take somebody that's been I don't know, driving lorries for 20 years and then say, oh, actually, don't worry, now you're managing these AI systems or creating, the, it's not going to happen. So that's what School of Code is. It's a retraining scheme to try and help people get more technical, more problem solving focused so that they can thrive in that sort of environment. Um, but I do think there needs to be a global discussion because most people haven't wrestled with this problem of um, really what you're creating is an intelligence and how, <laughs> how you put that back in a box is, is, uh, is difficult. So I think it, it makes sense to me to pause in the same way that you, you know, um, some of the advocates would say, you know, you can't necessarily pause technology, but we, we did that with things like nuclear weapons, right? We realized there was actually, you know, great um, potential, but there's great potential harms. There's some actors in the world that might not use them for the same means that, that you might want to use them for, might not be as um, safety conscious, no right? So, so let's actually sit down and think about like what are the frameworks that we need to put around this to make as even a playing field as possible. But even then, I just think you know it's uh, it's inescapable. I, I mean, situation. considering the fact that the, the the North Star seems to be you know this race towards artificial general general yeah. intelligence, where you know the AI is is way better than human cognitive ability and things of that nature uh, 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 and beyond. From your perspective, who should be pumping the brakes? You know, this letter has come out. Uh, who should be taking action? Should the AI labs respond? Uh, should government step in to say, you know what, uh, we're going to stop everything and put in legislation? Uh, where, where does that work start? So for me, again, I, I don't think we need to put on the brakes. I agree we need to put the framework in place that artificial intelligence becomes well guarded and, and managed and monitored. But again, we have the same rules for for other internet processes what domain names can you use on the internet um, how do all the internet servers communicate with each other who owns the responsibility for country uh, domain names and things like that so we can we are as a as a society we have all the abilities to do this i don't think we need a government-led approach but just a um, international uh, consortium of um, 
decision makers who drive policy, obviously in, in the interest for, of all of us. The other aspect, I think we need to be mindful of all the capabilities that we see coming through GPT today are either the, the chat based and again, also the text to image capabilities and all those uh, features that we have. Um, I don't think we need to we need to be scared about people's jobs or that suddenly a doctor, a machine will just take over and make the decision. We are not there yet. And therefore that, that's one of the reasons why I think we don't need to turn anything off or hold development. I think we can leverage the momentum that we have today and all the insights that we are gaining to develop AI further and make it more manageable and obviously secure in, in a sense for, for our society. Fantastic. And, and I think that that's a perfect segue to talk about, you know, leveraging the opportunities that it brings. And, and we have lots of business leaders and small business owners that watch this show. And, and for those, you know, people that watch, uh, I, I want to ask, there's this industry level conversation around AI, and we've been having that conversation as well. But when it comes to leveraging the opportunities, you know, how should small business approach uh, you know, the, the opportunities that AI presents and what, how can small businesses participate in the opportunities that it brings? I guess it depends what you mean by participate in the opportunities. And, and just to Bjorn's point there, I think, um, it, you know, we do have a lot of capability to have the discussions, right? But the discussions will come too late, like, and it's very hard to retrospectively, um, <laughs> you know, or punitively, like, put things back like it just doesn't work like that. So that's why I think it's really important to have these discussions up front. Um, because for example, we could give advice to small businesses today that say, hey, like, um, just like outsourcing unlocked a ton of potential, but also disrupted a lot of established jobs and markets, right? There's whole communities that have been left behind by offshoring and outsourcing. And, but there's a ton of potential for the individual business person to, to run lean, run quickly, run agile. So we could give some advice that says, hey, like personal assistants, essentially a lot of that now can be democratized for $20 a month. If you want someone to put together briefs and research and this and that, and that will only get better. Um, you could say, okay, how can you leverage the um, AI um, APIs so that you can build services for your audience and your customers on top of that? But the truth of the matter is, whatever we say today will be irrelevant tomorrow and next week and the week after because this stuff is exponentially getting better and that's just the pattern of evolution evolution created us right like and evolution is a really simple process it's stupid okay you you need a lot of failure to get ahead in evolution which is billions of years of us um this is different because this is evolution that can know everything that all of humankind has ever known at once can remember that information, take it to different contexts and improve itself. And when we get to the point which we're at now, which is not just the data that we've captured, but um, AI being trained on simulated data, so it can generate its own data, right? Um, now you've got, okay, it took however many billion years to, to create us. How many iterations and how many evolutions can happen? Um, infinitely more, infinitely better, infinitely uh, more optimized. So I think, you know, people really, it's really hard to understand the pace of change, change. That, that is about to happen. So yeah, my advice is just get ready for a lot of change. Interesting. <laughs> get ready for a lot of change yeah, is a yeah. good one. Sabin, your thoughts on how small businesses should be reacting so, to this? I think the first thing is protect your assets. And right now, your biggest asset is your information. So if you're a small business, gather as much information on your processes, on your um, yeah, but basically everything that has to do with your business, because that's the information that you can you can use later on uh, to analyze your business, to to plan for your business, and that's where you can leverage AI. Um, the other thing as well is I would I would also say, don't be ha too hasty to to go out and develop your own AI. It's out there, you know. Um, there's software as a service. There's also AI as a service. You know, explore this as an opportunity for you. Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel, especially not as a small company. And know? that's what I was going to touch on in, in my next question. And I, I'll let you still stay on that and then I'll come to, to, to be on in a minute. So if I run a business and I want to build an AI solution, I'm not a technology person. I'm not, I haven't studied AI at every level like you have. Where do I get started? You know, I want to bring an AI innovation into what we do. I want to create an AI driven product for our customers. 
Where do I start that thought, uh, Sabin? I was going to say chat G GPT. <laughs> That's probably not the right answer. Uh, look, um, I, I, I'm no expert in it as well because um, in our industry, we use a lot of software that's already got AI built into it. So the first place I would probably start is I would, I would contact Amazon or Google that have already got these frameworks in place and say, this, this is my business. What tools do you have? It's almost like uh, you know, looking for a specific app or a specific API that you can apply for your business. There are generic ones that you can already apply to your business. All you have to do is feed it the information. Absolutely. Yeah. Bjorn, what are your thoughts in terms of how small businesses can compute on top of what yeah. is out there? And and it's good that you raise this, not just small businesses, but even uh, larger, medium or large enterprises, they all want to leverage the capabilities because if you if you do this, you can stay ahead of the game, you can beat your competition or just improve your, your business processes. So like uh, Sabin and uh, Chris just said, leveraging AI is, there are lots of ways to do this. We as Visual, obviously we are a Microsoft partner. We implement this in, in Microsoft Azure, so the cloud capabilities. There are lots of uh, variations of how AI is already available. You can do things like object detection, which could be useful in a manufacturing process or a sentiment analysis to understand, okay, what is really the underlying message and sentiment somebody's speaking and talking about uh, that could be useful in, in any service desk scenario, for example, wherever you have customer interaction. So there, there's a, a full broad range of capabilities, even chat GPT <laughs> to mention it is now available through Microsoft in your own Azure tenant. And we already have worked with one customer and it was an interesting scenario. They were looking to uh, analyze um, clients CVs to understand and let AI judge how well a CV is matched against a role profile. And to take that even further, it's not just word matching, but really understanding different roles is a role description uh, matching and worthwhile and well described. So lots of different capabilities out there. Fantastic. And, and Chris, I want to talk a bit about, you know, following on from that, you know, train of thought, uh, if businesses are going to be relying more uh, on this and even consumers, I'm going to come to a consumer question, even as we begin to, 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 to wrap. Um, if businesses are going to be relying on more on this as a tool, whether for their internal processes or as part of their business development and product development processes, where does the question of trust lie? I mean, well, interesting question. So I think just building on what the, the guys were saying here, um, I, you know, I think actually it's going to be really easy to make a lot of progress in a short space of time where a lot of incumbent companies that might have a load of informational processes um, actually, that can be replicated really quickly. Um, so actually, I think it becomes your audience is, is really important. So service companies will, will you know, um, be disrupted quite a lot, but, but actually products and audience, um, if you've got an audience that you're satisfying and they come to you, um, this helps accelerate the ability for you to deliver to them more personalized service, all of that sort of stuff. So um, I think it is going to be really interesting. It can go one or two ways in, in my view. Either it's sort of like refrigeration. So when, when the fridge was invented, right, it's not the people who made the fridges that were like the world's, you know, cartel or whatever. Yeah. It was people like Coca-Cola who, you know, built an empire on top of that. So the optimist in me says, do you know what, maybe we'll get a couple of really innovative solutions built on top of these APIs. So even though OpenAI and Amazon and and Microsoft provide these services and obviously get paid very well for them, there will be some other companies really innovating on top that of them leverage. that really disrupt you. That's the optimist in me. The, the, the realist in me says, actually, it, it probably goes one of two ways. Um, Hyper-local content, so things like, you know, um, you will be able to, uh, a film that we would go and watch at the cinema today would take years and millions of and acting talent, um, you will be able to, with a text prompt, create a film like that in a couple of minutes. Um, and so it becomes, well, where is the value in that process anymore? So yeah, there's the audience is the value, because if you trust, to come to your point, if a, if a big studio has a lot of trust and a lot of audience, then maybe they'll still consume that. But you could also, also say, I come here and I say, hey guys, I've got a, a film I want to show you actually, and it's a custom film, and 
maybe you get a bit more of this, what we've experienced over the last few years with social media, a bit more of these bubbles forming, where actually you can consume every piece of content custom to you, which is both good and we've seen a lot of negatives there yeah. in terms of like how society can cope and react to that. So I think there's a load of questions we need answering in terms of, you know, um, is this an a, a agglomeration of power with a few companies or and everyone else figuring it out? Is it a load of, you know, um, broken up pieces of society that all feed themselves Absolutely. the information they want? Or is it something in between? Prob thank thank you so much for that, Chris. And to every single one watching, there's so many questions that are yet to be answered when it comes to artificial intelligence. So we want you to be a part of the conversation. So as you're watching this, make sure that you drop your comments, your thoughts, your questions. I'm going to be tagging these guys on LinkedIn as well and, and asking them to follow up on this question. But the last one I'm going to put to you guys, and I want everyone to answer this. So personally, what has been your favorite AI tool uh, thus far? So I'm going to start with you, uh, Bjorn. Uh, what would be your favorite AI tool? And uh, yeah, and then we'll just go across the room. Yeah. So for me, clearly, ChatGPT is is amazing with with its capabilities. But um, to the point Chris made, that you can use just text to describe what you want, and it creates an image, a painting, or even now already videos. For me, this is this is just mind blowing. I think there's a next iteration that we need to look out for, and maybe blockchain comes back into play for this. How do we validate that? there is an authentic photo of me or is it AI generated and the same for, okay. for a video. So how do we get authenticity back into this AI created content? But yeah, uh, very exciting times. Very exciting times indeed. Your favorite tool, Chris? Uh, well, I'd, I'd have to say something like ChatGPT because it's literally, I mean, what the, the fastest growing app ever, you know, Absolutely. Uh, ridiculous. So you know, that's really changed the landscape in a lot of people's consciousness about what AI is and what it can do. Um, I'd probably say something like Copilot, with GitHub Copilot, which helps you write code, which means every engineer, if they take advantage of that, will be in the top 10% of engineers that have ever lived in terms Incredible. of productivity, regardless of natural talent, Incredible. which is amazing, right? So that's the standing on the shoulders of giants. We just need to see, like, actually, where does that, where does that get us to and, and actually how, how, how long have we, we got? Get there? And, yeah. and Tavin, uh, what's been your favorite it, tool? It used to be ChatGPT until a few days ago, um, until I found out how Samsung leaked some of their IP through ChatGPT. Don't know if you've seen that article. But uh, interesting enough, enough my, my wife showed me a, a little, I don't, I don't even know what program it was, but essentially Barbie, the new Barbie movie is being launched and you, you can put your kid's photo, your favorite, pets photo in that Barbie and they're using that for viral marketing. Mm -hmm. And I wow. think that's amazing. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, when it comes to artificial intelligence, the possibilities are endless. I mean, I've been using all of the new AI driven features that Canva has put into, into, into their new design, which they launched uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I'm a big Canva user and that's been truly remarkable. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the panel today. It's been a great conversation, but I can be, I, I mean, we can be rest assured that this conversation is going to continue online. So guys, please make sure that you drop your comments. It's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, stay tuned. We've got more to come.